Um, it was kind of a short discussion because this was Eastern AI. So they'd say, okay, we want to improve production. Somebody would raise their hand, they'd say, what about type? No, we don't need to worry about type. <laughs> so we, we, we didn't have too many traits to talk about, so we could talk about other things. One of the things that was occurring at that time, I don't know how many of you remember, but uh, we had the Northeast Sire evaluation, and you'd have the uh, cows uh, ranked there, and there'd be a mixture of grayed cows and registered cows. And the discussion that came up was, what's the difference between a grayed cow and a registered cow? And as the group went around and, and gave their opinions, it, it quickly became obvious that the difference between the registered cow and the grade cow was who owned that cow. Was it a registered breeder? Was it a grade breeder? They were trying to get bulls into their AI company, and they identified the, the top cows, both grade and registered. They contacted those owners. They said, uh, we're interested in purchasing a, uh, a bull. You know, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was, uh, you know, it was enough to motivate a registered breeder. But what they found was they got very, very few grade bulls that, that would come in and, and could pass any of the health requirements. On the grade uh, side, I mean on the registered side, when they asked for those uh, bulls, they came in, they were healthy, the paperwork was all there. It was all the interest and enthusiasm and passion that the owners of the registered cows had that really drove Eastern into dropping the idea of let's putting out grade bulls and let's continue with having purebred registered bulls. So as I think of the breeders over time, I think about that passion and here's uh, pictures of uh, two uh, gentlemen that I respect uh, very much. And obviously I've become uh, friends with them because I could never put this picture up here if I uh, wasn't a, a good friend of Marvin Nunes. So passion definitely is a, uh, a key part. Excitement and enthusiasm that you all have for breeding is a second part. And here's just a few examples, but we could have examples like this from every single farm that is, is out there and the passion and enthusiasm that you display. And the other is the camaraderie that we all have with one another. Um, that's a very important part of our business. Uh, Paul Burr is in the back of the room. He's remembering this uh, picture and saying, I don't remember talking about cows that night, but I do remember the beer. <laughs> so, <clears throat> in some regards, I want to talk about how we feel about breeding cows and how that's an important part of being a successful breeder. And when I look at uh, different breeders and talk to them, you know, they all discuss the eye of the breeder, no question about it. And they talk about the uh, success that they feel personally from breeding good, good cows, good herd. And that feeling of success and recognizing that success and getting satisfaction, getting satisfaction from breeding a good herd of cows is really quite important. And it's not only important the satisfaction that we take in, in our own herds, but also somewhat the satisfaction that we have for others. We're really good at uh, getting people together, um, having a little contest, seeing uh, what we think of other people's uh, breeding stocks and recognizing them, rewarding them, and even admiring them. And that's an important part of uh, what we do as breeders, and there's a long history of us doing that. Now I'm going to say that we have a long, long history of respecting breeders. <clears throat> we talked about uh, city folks and country folks, and we're kind of unique in being the country folks. So I look at these uh, everyday products, carrots and peanuts, and when I have a carrot, I'm looking at it and I say, huh, where did this come from? How did we get these modern day carrots? And who are the breeders behind it? The same thing with peanuts. If I look at peanuts, I don't think of beer. <laughs> I think about the breeders that created those peanuts. And the peanuts is really a fascinating story because those are the ancestral uh, uh, ancestors of, of the peanuts. They actually have uh, 10 sets of chromosomes and the modern day peanut has 20 sets of chromosomes. 
So the modern day penis is a tetroid and the ancestors is a diploid. And it's amazing that breeders, by just crossing those ancestral strains over and over and over again, founding, finding something that was really unique, propagating that and uh, successfully creating a whole new uh, product. So this feeling, this idea of uh, part of being uh, successful is recognizing that you get joy from the whole act of breeding. <clears throat> and I think that that's uh, something that we cannot lose sight, particularly in these difficult times. It's the joy of breeding that motivates uh, many of us to have a good herd and we get, once we have a good herd, it gives us joy back. John Cole had this slide the other day, and I was really happy to see it. So not only do we derive success from our own efforts and our own breeding programs, but we also derive happiness and joy from looking at the success of others. And uh, we've heard Mendel's names mentioned several times. Almost every speaker has mentioned Mendel as they talk about uh, how we have entered the new, new era of, of genetics. So John Cole went to the actual Mendel's garden. He wanted to see what it looked like. He wanted to just kick that soil around a little bit, What's, how much clay is in there, how much sand is in there. He wanted to really feel kind of what, what Mendel was, was feeling. And Mendel obviously is highly successful. Uh, we view what he did as far as uh, uh, discovering how genetics really works, that we have two sets of uh, chromosomes and uh, those chromosomes are uh, transmitted uh, independently. And then we have dominant alleles and recessive alleles and you get this classical three to one uh, ratio. And so we admire him, we respect him and we think, gee, uh, it, would be nice, it would be nice to be like him, but it's probably not possible. I'd like to be like him, but uh, it, it's just not possible. We forget that all of these great people struggled. And I want to mention a, a few of uh, Mendel's struggle. This was his first experiment. I mean, it took multiple years to get uh, multiple generations, and then he analyzed that data. But once he was done with his, this first experiment, he went on to a second experiment. And that second experiment was with this plant, hawkweed. And unknown to him, hawkweed is uh, one of these plants that reproduces asexually. So when he looked at the results, he looked at the parents, selected the parents, looked at the offspring, all the offspring looked exactly alike. He created the F2. All the F2 looked exactly alike. They're all clones of one another. He never published another paper after that first paper that was so, so brilliant. But I think that <clears throat> that did not determine his life. Uh, Mendel went on to be a very beloved and uh, respected uh, religious leader. And he remained very interested in plant breeding throughout his life. He was actually a, a judge of flower shows, and there's a, a fuchsia that's uh, named after him uh, today. So I also went on my uh, little pilgrimage of looking at the, uh, the greats in the field of, uh, of genetics. So I went to the Galapagos recently, and it was, it was for the same reason as, as John Cole. I wanted to walk in the, in the same footsteps as Darwin, I wanted to swim where he swam, I wanted to, to think what he was thinking. So that's what I did. I went to some of the exact same places, I reread his books and, and reread his thoughts and, and tried to, uh, uh, to imagine being there with him. And I swam in some lovely locations and had a good time. Part of the reason I put this picture up, th up there is I think when you're in a wetsuit, it makes you look slimmer. <laughs> so, where, where's Jeff? That was, that's my advice, is uh, clothing is, is quite, quite important. But when we think about Darwin, we know how great he is, but we fail to uh, appreciate uh, the struggles and the difficulties that he had. 
Yeah, it's, it, you go there and you come back with the exact same thoughts about how animals adapt to their environment and how those animals that are more successful leave more progeny and after time, after time, uh, the whole species starts to change and evolve. But Darwin knew this early on. He's, you can read his early notes, and then you can read notes that he had 10 years later and notes that he had 20 years later. But it wasn't 23 years and later until he actually published his book on the origin of, of the species. So I would say that uh, in, in hindsight, we view these scientists as being highly successful. And we respect them not only for the work that they did, but their, their willingness to pursue the goals that, that, that they had. And just as we have as a, uh, a theme of this conference, uh, legends, they were legends in genetics, and it's not just because they were highly successful, but it was because they kept at it, and they struggled, and they overcame those uh, difficulties. So in the genomics era, I'd like to say that we actually have it easier. We have it much easier than Mendel had it. We had it much easier than, than Darwin had it. And we hear, have heard several times, I put uh, a famous geneticist also up here, Mark Current. And really, we hear this time and time again. No time in our history has there been more interest in genetics than right now. I mean, these, we may not realize it, these are the good years. And individual farmers, more and more of them are asking, how can I take control of my breeding program? How can I accelerate the rate of genetic improvement? How can I make my herd more efficient? So it's the individualization of breeding programs. We hear about genomic programs. How do you gear your, your program specifically to what it is that you want to achieve? And at the beginning of genomics, uh, we, we were pulling off individual herds, looking at their success and using them as models of, uh, oh, everybody should be doing this. So I put together this slide. Uh, I won't mention who that herd is, but it's a uh, individual herd that did uh, a lot of, uh, used a lot of the tools of genomics and accelerated the uh, genetic progress that they were making. And as you can see, you know, the, the progress that's being made for that exceptional herd is two times, three times, four times uh, more than breed average. And so I created this slide actually three times. There's an earlier version, the 2014. It was updated here in this 2016. And the reason why I kept updating it is because I was kind of haunted by the slide. I liked it a lot initially. And then I started thinking, well, what about that slower improving herd? What are we doing for that herd? And what kind of messages do we have to get to, to that individual, that owner? And how do we keep that herd in the system? And the reason is, is that we failed that, that person. That herd is out of business. And to me, this is an important message, and, and I'd like to convey it to you. We are in exciting times. We have more tools than ever before to accelerate genetics in our herd. And the, the necessity to improve the genetics in our herds is probably at the greatest that it's ever been. So we hear time and time about this genomic revolution, how we're improving the rate of genetic gain. And we hear reports from Canada, we hear reports from Australia, we hear reports here at our own conference that we've accelerated the rate of genetics two, three times what it used to be. So we can kind of forget this is what's happening nationally or this is what's happening internationally, this is what's happening somewhere else. But the reality is that it has to be happening within your herd too you have to have accelerated the rate of genetic improvement in your own herd two, three, four times than it used to be. That's what the speakers up here were talking about yesterday. They were saying they can see improvements, they can see it, and uh, they know the value of uh, having a better herd of cows. <clears throat> so I, when I talk to uh, breeders, <clears throat> almost everybody says, I'm improving. I look at my genetic reports, I'm making progress, uh, it's pretty good times. It's not, but you can no longer just look at the genetic reports and say, I'm going up. It's how fast are you going up? 
Are you making a lot more progress today than you did five years ago? And if you're not, you have to make some changes, alter your mindset a little bit. And I also run into individual farmers <coughs> that I have exampled here. We have breed average and we have a, a prominent. Everybody knows who this person is. When I talked to this person, I said, what the heck's going on? I said, I just looked at, at your uh, genetic progress report. Here it is. What's going on? And the answer is, well, well, you know, I'm kind of following my own thing. I want to beat the system. I want to have animals that are different from everybody else. That's okay. I respect that, and I don't have a problem with that. But at the same time we're having this discussion, the sun is over on the side. The sun has just come back. The sun is looking to take over this herd. And that's the problem that I had, and that's the discussion that, that went on, is that you can do whatever you want, and you can follow whatever goals that you have, but you can't dig that hole too deep that when you turn this herd over to the next generation, that that ge next generation is going to have the genetics that they can compete in uh, today's environment. And that thought about how genetics is more important than ever, more critical for the survival of each and every one of us. <clears throat> I went back and I looked at our, the information that we have in, in our database, the Holstein database. What was the average TPI of the animals in the herd in 2010? And then I broke them into these five groups. And I said, okay, <clears throat> the herds that were in the low group, the, the bottom 20 percentile, if you look at them, 40% of those herds are still in business. 60% have exited. If you go up to the, the top group there, 80% of those herds are still in business. The relationship between the genetics in your herd and having high genetics in your herd, having good genetics in the herd, is more important today than ever. So when we talk about this genomics era, this genomics revolution, this time to use genetics for our, our benefit, absolutely. And if we don't, there's consequences. So to me, one of the biggest change when we talk about the evolving role of breeders, the, the, the role or what has changed is our measure of success. We still like to put a bull into AI. We still like to sell a lot of uh, animals, excess heifers, and that's good. It can bring in money. But for many, many folks, the goal, the measure of success, is just having a financially viable farm, having a good herd of, of cows, having high genetics in, the, in those cows so that you stay breeders. And you can pick any breeders. The breeders from yesterday panel, uh, I thought, said it very well, I was, and they all said it. The first goal, the first goal nowadays is to improve the genetics in your herd make your herd more efficient, make your herd more profitable. The second goal, which is kind of frosting on the cake, if you can do it, is to sell elite genetics. And we hear this from many people. This is from the convention in New York a couple of years back, uh, Kevin Peck there, describing his uh, genomics program and uh, explaining how he used uh, genomic young sires and sex semen and genomic testing and embryo transfer and IVF. And it was like, whoa. I mean, that was my reaction. It was, whoa, this guy is really pushing it. And there's other people like him that are really pushing it. And so how does it, what do we see amongst everybody? We see a greater spread in the quality of the herds from top to bottom. The, spread, the herds are really spread out. And I looked at this from different time periods, but really this is the time that we're interested in, 2018. The spread between that top herd, all those top herds and the bottom herds is greater than ever before. And we have a measure, uh, I, here I use PTA uh, net merit dollars. Uh, what's the average PTA net merit dollars of the cows in those herds? And of course that uh, measure tells you uh, increased revenue, increased profits, and it's somewhat difficult talking about increased profits. So I thought, 
it's probably a lot more uh, meaningful to, talk, to turn these numbers around a little bit and, and explain how improved genetics can lower the cost of production, can make you more efficient. So I did that. I converted the net merit dollars into uh, cost of production. And if we look at the top third versus the bottom third, the, uh, the difference in net merit dollars of the cows, 439, but it transfers into a dollar less per hundredweight. So the higher genetic herds are producing milk at a lower cost than the herds that have uh, lower genetics. That's what's explaining why higher genetic herds are staying around, lower genetic herds are exiting in at a higher rate. Just to show the, that uh, on uh, using the cost of production, if you go to the most extremes, we're pushing $2 uh, difference between cost of production between the elite herds and the, and the lower herds. And what's exciting is that much of this uh, genetic improvement is coming from the female side. You know, we've tracked ET for a long time, and, and basically the, the donor dams for ET animals were just a little bit above breed average. Uh, this, this slide here stops at 2016, but it really has accelerated even more. So the females, as far as looking at uh, improvements in uh, the level of uh, one's herd, female contribution is much, much greater than it's ever been at any other time. Now we look at uh, different programs. We kind of had a group of uh, larger herd uh, owners yesterday. And some of this technology is related to herd size. Um, it's not size neutral. Uh, those herds that are larger uh, can uh, do embryo transfers, flushing, et cetera. They're doing more genomic testing. So we see 57% of the genomic tests are actually coming from the herds that have cows with, uh, uh, with have a thousand or more cows. So my comment would be that uh, each individual has to look at their own situation and determine what of those tools that we now have, genomic young size, genomic testing, ET, IVS, which is the best for you? Because it's gonna differ herd by herd by herd. And we heard that, um, you know, we heard that uh, you don't do this unless you have a plan, and once you have a plan, you try to figure out how to uh, enact it. But the key, to me, the primary role of the breeder today is much like it's been yeah, all throughout history, is to keep that herd moving in the right direction. Identify what it is that's gonna make money and just keep bringing in better and better and better genetics and raising the genetic level of your, of your herd. And I, I like this um, article that was in uh, Hoard's Dairyman. They repeat, they update it uh, every year or so. And the description, I thought, was very uh, fitting. They, they call them cow islands. These cow islands that are spread across the United States. And to me, this is what the, the concept in the genomics era is as it relates to individual farms. We want to look at the farms and we want to keep these farms afloat. Think of your herd as, a, as an island and keeping it afloat. Now, <clears throat> I've talked a lot about individual herds, but we also have to consider the big picture. And that's why we have smart people like uh, Boyd to uh, bring, bring the big picture into the discussion. And there's no question that we uh, have more tools to breed in, in uh, any direction that we want to go than ever before. We can get there faster than ever before. We all take uh, ownership and pride in discussing um, uh, keeping the Holsteins as, as the number one breed in the United States. We talk about keeping U.S. Holsteins as the, as the breed, number one breed around the world. <clears throat> Dairy cattle breeding, we've heard a lot about uh, the swine industries and different applications. And my belief is that uh, the individual breeder is going to be a major player in the future. The previous speaker uh, said that, so I say I had a sigh of relief. <laughs> but in my uh, uh, informal surveying of the uh, AI industry, I asked them the very question. I said, what's the role of the individual breeder? What percentage of the bulls will you be getting from uh, 
uh, individual breeders as opposed to what percentage will be uh, uh, developed from your own programs. And the answer comes out to be about 60-40. That's the feeling that uh, I get. 60% um, coming from individual breeders, 40% from their, from their own program. And we can see many elite herds around the country. And I show this because uh, hopefully it will encourage some, but we, it should give joy to all of us. We should be very happy that we have herds and uh, several herds uh, that have the genetics in their herd much higher than the average Holstein cow and much higher than the bulls that are being offered today. So the herds, the dams and the sires in these elite herds are really exceptional. And uh, when you look at these herds, and these herds are 1,000 cows, 5,000 cows, et cetera, it only makes sense that the AI companies are going to look at these herds, realize that there's elite genetics coming out of them, and continue to buy from those herds. So that's something, I think that's where the future uh, lies, and that's something that we should all take uh, uh, happiness in. So we're all making uh, progress and we all need to uh, be happy and take uh, joy in, in being a part of uh, this great industry. So how has things uh, changed? Certainly we cannot all be elite breeders. Um, it's a very expensive process. Uh, there's a lot of work in, involved into it. <clears throat> but there's no question that the tools available today, as far as being a, a part of the genomics era, um, we have more opportunity to make faster genetic improvement within our own herds. And it's not only the opportunity, but it's a necessity. It's a necessity to keep your herds afloat, to keep them financially sound. And so we have, I would say, a, a more of an interest in genetics. Or we need to be invigorated in genetics. And uh, what better group to uh, be doing that than this group here, the registered breeders. So good genetics leads to better cows, higher revenue, lower cost of production. So we certainly have a, uh, a challenge, and uh, I don't know who bets best to uh, uh, bring that uh, challenge forward and uh, encouragement to the group. But I've asked uh, Darwin, I've walked in his footsteps, I've uh, swam in the same seas as him, and I think that what he would tell us if he was here today, hang in there. It's going to be a heck of a ride. It has been a heck of a ride, but uh, hang in there. So thank you very much. I think that um, our role has been the same role that we've had for uh, centuries, and that is to try to understand genetics, try to appreciate genetics, appreciate the genetics that we have in our own herds and that we have in the breed, and uh, make the genetics work for you. Thank you.